Hey, how's it going? From the title, you can tell I'm branching out to other games, Ruby and Sapphire, games that I wasn't initially familiar with, but I did play through it one time and I decided that it was time for a spiel run. Everyone's favorite spherical spiel, at least it's mine. As a Pokemon, it's really grown on me. I do play Pokemon Go and the Christmas scarf spiel was amazing. And then we got a community day and I just thought that there couldn't really be a better pre-evolved Pokemon to start Generation 3 with. And since I'm just diving straight into the footage on this one, if you are new to the channel and enjoy Pokemon solo runs, Subscribe if that is of interest to you. If you're someone who just never comments, scroll down and just type in Ball Boy below and make sure that spiel gets all of your energy. Now as we move forward, keep in mind that I'm keeping the same rules that I always do and they'll be in the description if you aren't familiar, but the overall tone of this one is going to be much more casual. There isn't anything to race against and I don't consider myself well versed in these games, so it's just overall going to be more of a laid back experience. With that said, on my test run, I ran into a lot of problems and I have it laid out hopefully this one will be much smoother and that starts off at the very start with resetting for IVs. There's a few things to note. There's natures now, there's more stats, there's special attack and special defense and IVs go up to 31 now instead of 15 in red and blue so I have a new solution. I'm just going to use a save editor. The amount of resets to not only get the nature that you want but also get a competent Pokemon is just a huge time sink and nobody has time for that. I go for a hasty nature because my practice run I had a negative speed nature and it made some of the fights pretty bad and I think that this will help out a lot. This will be the standard probably going forward for the channel. Every Pokemon being its best version and on an even playing field just seems like the best fit. Now let me know what you think about that. I don't really see a drawback and I can also just make this feel shiny and that adds at least four points to my mental health. In my opinion Ruby and Sapphire is the last Pokemon game where there isn't just an egregiously long tutorial and after a quick hike up to Route Three, we get our first rival battle. I picked Trico for the rival because I'm at least weak to its moves. It feels ice and water typing as well as it starting with both an ice and water move means that I can hit the fire and grass starters for super effective damage and I'll resist the water starter. I'll even do neutral damage to it since it's Swamper. There's no great choice here but the rival in Generation 3 is not that big of a deal as opposed to Generation 1. After heading back to the lab I get some Pokeballs and let me introduce you to one of my favorite things about Ruby and Sapphire. Zigzagoon has the ability pick up and that means that there's a chance after battle that it'll pick up an item. There's a chart and it gets a little bit more in depth in Emerald but in Sapphire there's a good chance of the pick up item being Super Potion and then you can rarely get things like PP ups and rare candy which are ridiculously good things to just get for free. The first order of business in this run is to get a squad of five Zigzagoons to sit behind their spiel leader and just let me slowly accumulate these items as I progress through the entirety of the game. And you can see from the footage that I get a rare candy just in the time that I'm building up my party And this will easily be the most lucrative thing you can do and it's available to do ridiculously early in the game The next place I visit is Petalburg City I have to say I really like the concept that your family moved here because your dad took a job as a gym leader But just like in true Pokemon fashion We are not allowed to fight the first gym we come across and we'll be revisiting Norman later in the run This leads us to meeting the world's most sickly boy named Wally this is the catching tutorial, but I guess dad just doesn't know that I'm running around with a small squad of zigzagoons at this point. Up in the Petalburg Woods, you have your first run in with whatever version you have spilling. In our case, it's going to be Team Aqua. They're up to no good. I'm not going to go too in depth into the story beats of the game, but for the first video, I'll at least make mentions of some of this stuff. Outside of the woods is a very important item. There are a couple of cherry berries to pick up. They are a single use held item that can cure paralysis, and it will be very useful in the future. Shortly after, it's Time to visit the first gym in Rustboro. Roxanne is a rock type gym leader and as a water type, Spill is very well equipped to take this one on. Geodude is double weak and goes down swiftly, but Nosepass does have access to rock moves and it hits our little icy ball for super effective damage. It's not a clean fight, but it is a one shot victory and that's the first badge down. I pick up the Quick Claw from Trainer School because honestly there's not a lot of options for held items in the game. I love held items as a concept, but all the great ones seem to be locked behind the post game content or just require some things that I can't necessarily do but that's neither here nor there. Next up I pick up Cut and the only thing I'll say about Cut is that it's surprising 
surprising how useless it is in this game. I haven't watched any speedruns, but I don't think it's even required despite being an HM. There are no essential areas that are locked off by any shrubs from what I saw. From there, you save Pico the Wingo for a sailor named Mr. Brownie in our next Team Aqua run-in. He also had the Devon Goods, but that's not really important. What is important that Mr. Brownie will now give us a ride on his boat to the next town, Duford. Luckily, there's not many water type trainers in the early game, but Spill struggles with them. Thankfully, at level 19, Body Slam becomes available. From my Generation 1 runs, you know how great this move is, but having that added coverage is going to go a long way from here on out. And now it's time for the second gem, and Brawly is a problem. He's the fighting type gem, and I'm an ice type. This fight is not great, and I get absolutely obliterated a lot of times. If the Machamp decides to actually attack, it'll destroy me, and even if I get past it, the Makuhita hits just as hard. You need to get things to go basically perfect, and I just kind of bash my head against one to see if I can get this one done without grinding. After lots of times, I eventually get a sequence where the Machop just does nothing but leer, I take no damage, the Makuhita goes for a bulk up, and then I crit on my second move to take the battle without taking any damage. And it was just that easy guys, just critically hit. The second badge is down, and that is one of the hurdles for Sphere over, and I didn't have to grind so that's good. After bumping around in the dark and finding some Zubats, I meet Steven, and then I hitch a ride with Mr. Brownie to the next town. I win some Sody Pops on the beach, and wouldn't you know that Team Aqua is up to no good in Slateport, which is yet another useless town that you essentially just pass through. Now we're on our way to Ballville, and it's time for our second rival fight. Her team consists of a Welmer, a Numel, and a Grovile. The first two aren't an issue, and in this case the Grovile really isn't either, but trust me when I say that Leaf Blade and its high critical hit ratio could easily one-shot me if the AI decided it. We got lucky this time, and let's move on to more pressing matters. In Ballville, we run into the world's sickliest boy, Wally, and he challenges us with a single level 16 Ross. I quickly crush his hopes and dreams and send him back to his little bubble to live out his days and we'll never hear from Wally again guys. He'll never show his face to us. Next up it's time for the third gym and we have a huge problem. It's the electric gym but it's way worse than what it sounds. I picked up all the extra trainers around the side routes so that I could be as high level as possible and let's just quickly talk about this one. Watson in my opinion is going to be Spill's single toughest challenge in the game and we aren't even that deep in. There's lots of things to unpack, but we'll get to all the reasons why this battle was my own personal hell. His team seems simple enough. He's got a level 22 Magnemite, a level 20 Voltorb, and a level 23 Magneton as the ace. Now first off, there aren't any TMs that could help Spill, and I'm stuck with Water Gun as my primary source of damage. Powder Snow, Aurora Beam, and Body Slam are all resisted due to the steel typing of the Magnet Brothers, and relying on the extremely weak Water Gun just isn't great. The second thing, and the most obvious, is that any electric move thrown at me is just gonna hit like a truck and even if I manage to make it to the Magneton I just don't have the power to get through the fight. Third is the fact that Magnemite's AI will almost always go for a Thunder Wave first turn that's gonna paralyze us and luckily that can be prevented. Do you remember those cherry berries we picked up earlier? That gives us a free turn but it's still gonna be very tough and an uphill battle. And you can see from the footage that with the cherry berry and a bit of luck I could potentially be at full health going into the Magneton but I'm still a long ways off from being able to take this out. Ice Beam from the game corner is an option, but it costs 80,000 Pokey Dollars to just buy, and you can't manipulate the slots like you can in some of the other versions, and I'm not going to waste that much time for a cheesy strategy. What it comes down to is good old fashioned grinding, and what's awful about it is the best wild Pokemon I have access to are only level 13 and 14, so it's just going to take a long time. I weave in some tries here and there, but I'm going to spare you guys the tedium, and let's just cut ahead through the magic of video editing to when I start making some watts in progress. But on a positive note, this is a great opportunity to have some pickups for our zigzagoons to get us some rare candies, maybe some pee, -pee ups for the future when we're a little bit stronger. Ultimately, that leads us to level 35, and on the second attempt at this level, let's take a look. On the Magnemite, about level 33 was the consistent point where Water Gun was a two-shot. You do outspeed, you take it to half health or below, use the Cherry Berry to heal the paralysis, and then you take it out. On the Voltorb, level 35 was key because this is where Aurora Beam can one-shot it consistently and you can avoid taking any extra damage. You're never going to outspeed it, so you just have to eat a spark or whatever it throws at you, and hopefully you'll be 
healthy enough going into the Magnemite. The Magnemite is a wild ride. I outspeed it, but Water Gun only does about 40% of its health. It goes for a Thunder Wave, and since I'm paralyzed, it gets two turns in a row. It follows up with a Supersonic. It misses, but I still lose my turn due to being paralyzed. Things aren't looking great, so I just go for some Hail Mary resisted body slams. The idea is that if I get a paralysis proc, will be equal, and then I can start going first again. I do get the proc, but I fail to knock it out. It survives with just a sliver of health. It gets a potion, and then I start unloading water guns, desperately hoping to get past this one. I get it low, but it manages to hang on once again, and that prompts another super potion. I keep shooting water at it, just hoping the AI gives me a break. And that's exactly what happens. After some persistence, I take it out with some extreme luck because it didn't go for shockwaves, but I'll take it. This battle took a really long time to get past, and I'm just glad it's over with. I'm not exaggerating when I say that this is as hard as it's going to get for Spill. Not that there's not going to be any tough battles or anything like that coming up, just that this one's going to take the crown because I've already spent hours on this fight already. Now with Rock Smash, I break the rocks to unite these two lovers. It gives me strength as a reward, and then they say, they're gonna go off to rest. I might be 10 years old, but I think they're gonna go fuck. From there, there's yet another town to just pass through. I appreciate the world building of having towns that don't have gems and have other purposes, but there's a lot in this game, and Balabar is just something to pass through. The next several bits of the game are going to deal with Team Aqua trying to do some evil shit and Team Magma trying to stop them. I will say that I think it's interesting that what team is the villain and which team is trying to stop them depend on the version you're playing, but outside of that, it's a Pokemon plot. This part basically makes you do one big circle. You loop back around to Mauville, then you revisit the initial area north of where you were blocked off from earlier because it just wanted to railroad you towards a cutscene. You do get this sweet cutscene of riding the lift up to Mount Chimney, and some would say that all that time wasting was worth it just for that and I'm not one of those people. It culminates in a battle with Aqua Leader Archie, and it's not too interesting of a fight. It's gonna take a while to get anything interesting, mainly due to how much I had to grind past Watson. At this point, I have a level 40s feel, and I'm gonna get level 20s. I'd also like to take this time to say that Carvana, and by extension Sharpedo, they have to be the the world's weakest defensively frail Pokemon I've ever seen. They die to resisted moves and I just find that funny. These are all that Team Aqua uses and they are very frail. Anyway, some plot happens. I chase them off. Uh, 10 year old chase them off. I'm very intimidating and we can resume our normal spill business. The next location is Lava Ridge and from the name, you could probably guess that this is the fire type gym and Flannery is not going to have a good time. Not only do I have a water type, but I have a massive level advantage from the hyperbolic training that Watson forced me to do. And this one's over very quick. It's not worth diving deep into, but just that's four badges down. Now it's time for some backtracking to Pedalburg. And that means that it's time to face our dad and see if he made a smart decision uprooting his entire family for this line of work. I mentioned earlier that I love the concept of the dad and the gym, but I also love the idea of the gym. Norman is a normal type trainer and his gym is very simple. There are two doors to go through. And for example, they'll say one door will say one hit KO and the other one will say strength room and the battles will have them use a item and that's just a neat concept to me. Now normally Norman the normal top trainer wouldn't sound like it would be too bad but Slaking is a monster. Seriously if you don't know check out Slaking stats. It's higher than some legendaries and it hits like a truck. It has truant as its ability and that means that it's only going to do something every other turn but it hurts a lot. I get absolutely clapped on the first attempt and it's looking like I'm going to need to make some adjustments. On the second attempt I don't even make a I don't make any adjustments. It just so happens that I level up after the first slaking, and that's the level I learned Blizzard, and I just learn it and I just use it against the other slaking and the Vigoroth, and it's an easy battle, and that's five down. Afterwards, the parents to the world's sickliest boy want to thank me for beating Wally's ass earlier, and they give me Surf. It goes without saying how strong of a move Surf is, for just water types in general, and I've been using Water Gun the entire game. It's a gargantuan spike in power. It's much needed. Then there's this part of the game I honestly found weird. Uh, Watson's just in the middle of Mauville. He asks us to go to an underground area called New Mauville to turn on the generator before the situation gets out of control. And then you just do it and it's never brought up again. You do get Thunderbolt for it, but am I missing something? Let me know. After a short surf, it's time to make our way to the Weather Institute, but the first order of business is to catch a Tropius. In my opinion, it's one of the coolest Pokemon designs out of everything, but for the purposes of this run, it's the world's best HM Mule. This thing 
can learn everything. Flash, cut, rock smash, strength, fly. It can learn a lot of them. It's great to have. The Weather Institute isn't worth going into, but all you need to know is that the reward is a cast form, but more importantly, it's holding Mystic Water, and that will boost the damage of Surf, and it'll be probably more useful than Quick Claw, in my opinion. That's the real price. Directly after this is the next rival fight, and I honestly don't get this one. Her team is exactly the same as last time. There's no additions, there's no evolutions, there's nothing like that. It just comes down to the same thing, and that's if the AI wants to use Leaf Blade, and then if Leaf Blade wants to crit, it does use it, but it doesn't crit, and I win. She gives me Fly, then I'm on the way. In Fortree, I can't challenge the gym leader just yet because something mysterious is in the way, so onwards we go. 15 steps down the road, Steven immediately gives us the item to see the invisible Kecleons. I beat up that stupid idiot and I get the Devon Scope. Kecleon still isn't in Pokemon Go, by the way. It's the only Owen Pokemon left, even, that, even though they're releasing Hisui in Pokemon. What's up with that? From there, I waste a lot of time. In my practice runs, I was running with an Abra, and the idea here was that I would continue Continue on the path, finish up some business, go to Lily Cove to unlock the fly location. Then I would use Abra to teleport back and do the gym. But I don't even have an Abra. I'm just stupid. Mount Pyre is the next story segment. Archie takes the red orb. So naturally when he's done, they just give the blue orb to a random 10 year old. And that's it. They just they just give it to you. I pick up the flight location in Lily Cove. And I make the walk of shame back to Fort Tree. And here this Kecleon knows what I did to the other one. And it just runs away from me. And I make my way into the gym. Winona is the flying top gym leader. And I can respect that she has a Skarmory and a Pelipper on the team. Respectively, their steel and water types make any ice move only do neutral damage, but it's not enough. Altaria also gets a participation trophy. I love Altaria, but an ice cube can kill my fluffy little beautiful cloud bitch. And now we're just cruising along. And speaking of cruising, here's a wrecked ship. People are just hanging out here for no reason. More importantly, this place has ice beam just sitting around, and wouldn't you feel stupid if you spent 80000 on it earlier in the game corner? Back in Slateport, Team Aqua just steals a submarine. And now we're back in Lily Cove. Keep up, guys. We're moving rapid pace here. The next rival fight is here. And the only real difference is that now she has a Swellow. And the rest of the team is just the same. I have 20 levels over her. And it's just a massacre. I gotta move on real quick before my video gets flagged. There's an Aqua hideout segment. And I'm just gonna skip over it because nothing happens and it's boring. Let's pick up back in Moss Deep City where Steven has a house. He gives us the dive TM. But we do need to get the next badge. Conveniently, it's right here in the city and I like this gym. I'm a sucker for conveyor belts. But this gym does have a problem. It's the one time in the game you are forced to do a double battle and this is a solo run. And you might say, Matt, what is the magical solution here? Well, let's check it out. Let me introduce you to our new friend, Little Ball. It's a level one shiny spiel whose sole purpose is just to die. So for this battle, all you need to know is that they are weak to water and Surf is going to hit both of them at the same time. And that's it. That's pretty much the whole entire fight. There's no need to go in depth with it. Uh, outside of how cute Little Ball is. Now's the part of each Pokemon game where you have to wrap up the story parts. And there are two parts here. The first one is rather lengthy, so let's shorten it up a little bit. With Dive, you can now access the C4 Cavern, and we can finally see what that dastardly Team Aqua is up to. The key part in here, and something that's going to come in key in the end game, is that this is where we get Earthquake. With this and Body Slam, we have tons of coverage, and we need it. The Cavern segment culminates in the final battle against Archie, and am I surprised you that I actually lose this one a few times. The first time is going great, but Crobat confuses me, and then I hit myself, and then Sharpedo comes in and crits me, and that's it. The second time, I do get confused by the Crobat, and Crobat just crits me himself, and I'm dead again. The third time is the charm. I avoid the bad RNG of hitting myself or getting crit, and I'm able to smash through the team with my full offensive moveset. This one just goes to show how fragile Spiel can be if it gets CC'd and has some bad luck, but maybe it won't be a reoccurring thing. Anyways, after that, Archie just doesn't give a shit. I beat him up and he still just awakens Kyogre. It starts a massive downpour of rain that threatens to submerge the entire region and they're happy about it for some reason. And then everybody comes in to draw attention to it and then that's it. The last little piece of story takes us to Pseudopolis. It's a very cool city. You have to enter via diving. I like the layout of it. Steven and Wallace are talking about the mysterious cave of origins and since some old lady randomly gave us the blue orb, they just let a 10 year old jump in here to handle a godlike Pokemon that controls water because why not? I go in, I smack Kyogre on the butt, and that's that. No one ever mentions it again, and now we can get back to our regularly scheduled gym 
and Elite Four run. And now we have to talk about the 8th gym. I battle all the trainers under the ice for extra experience and I have to say that this ice puzzle has to be up there for my absolute favorite puzzle in any gym in the entire series. I like it a lot but that's beside the point. We've been riding the high after having that level up advantage after Watson and that has allowed us just to roll through the entire game but Wallace is going to put a stop to that. The main reason is that he has a water type team and they'll resist most of my moves. It makes it an absolute slog so let's just kind of dive into the first attempt to go over some of the problems. Love Disc is first and let's be honest nobody's worried about Love Disc. On some of the attempts it will use a track. It'll survive a little bit longer but for the most part it's just a couple of body slams and that's going to be it. Next up is Wish Cash and it's a water ground typing which means that it's going to take heavy neutral damage from Surf. You do outspeed so getting off that first Surf is key because it loves to use Amnesia and that'll just negate your damage after that. A body slam can finish it off after but much like the Love Disc it's just another easy part of the fight. Now let's start getting into the meat and potatoes about what makes this fight difficult. Wallace is also a Steel fan and he has a Cilio. This fight comes down to one thing and that's who can get the paralysis proc on body slam first. On my first attempt Wallace does get the paralysis and even though I'm able to get past the status condition is just going to hinder us moving forward. Next up is Seeking. It'll make it rain and the increase to water damage will allow us to both to do pretty respectable damage despite it being resisted if you want to go that route. This is the point of the fight where I can make it past but hyper potions into some chip damage whittling me down make it very difficult. By the time I make it to Melodic, I'm just in too much of a deficit to make a comeback. The second attempt is much better. I avoid paralysis, but you can still see it's really tough. I almost managed to get through this one, but I fail. Looking back, the strategy could have easily been using another cherry berry to eliminate paralysis entirely from the equation, and that would have made this one much more consistent, but I guess past me was just being too stubborn. I actually get through this fight on the third attempt, but it's much tougher than the number of tries indicate. I'm able to get lucky on this field, I nuke it down real quick, I avoid paralysis, and I'm able to remain healthy enough on the seeking when getting into the melodic. The strategy for melodic is pretty straightforward. I want to avoid getting it into hyper potion range, so I go for a few body slams, and then I hope that it's in range to be knocked out with an earthquake. I have enough health to hang on, and I do get a crit on the earthquake, but I'm not sure it was really needed, but I'll just take this win. That's the final batch down. And now it's time for Victory Road, and you know the drill here. I'm blazing through it as fast as I can. There are some good things here like max elixir and a PP up, but other than that, I just want to get through without lingering too long. And at the very end, it's the sickliest boy in the world, Wally. He comes out and he dares challenge me to a battle. He's a pathetic trainer. It's going to be easy. Who cares? He leads with Altaria. Ice Beam's going to cut it in half. Then he brings out a Rosalia. Ice Beam is just going to take that out. It's just an easy fight. Then he brings in a Magneton. It's weak to Earthquake. Uh, this this feels like revenge against Watson to me. It's just another one shot. And then he's bringing in Delcati. And it's just another pathetic attempt. It goes down to a single serve. But then there's Gardevoir. It starts out with Double Team. I Body Slam and I get the Paralysis proc. But it has Synchronize. And I also get paralyzed. It then just psychics me down and I just, I lose my entire life is a lie. I didn't know what to do at this point. My second attempt, another double team starts us off. This time I go for Earthquake to avoid paralysis on myself, and Wally uses a pretty effective strategy. He uses Calm Mind while using potions to survive my attacks, and eventually his psychics are so powerful that it overwhelms me and I lose once again. The third attempt, I do get it done, but at this point my confidence has just dwindled. I'm not feeling great about the Elite Four after Sick Boy Wally handled me a couple of times. From there I head straight to the Elite Four. No candies are needed yet because I just want to see how it's going to be. I do use my PP ups and I head to the first trainer, Sydney. He's a dark top trainer and let's just see how that goes. He starts off with a Mighty Inna. It barely survives a serve. That triggers a full restore. I get a free turn. Ice Beam takes it low and then a Body Slam finishes it off pretty clean. Cacturn is up next. It's slower than me and I have Ice Beam. It's another easy kill so far. So good. Next up is Sharpedo and I joked how frail it was but it hits up noxiously hard especially when it gets that special drop and it decks me pretty quick and that didn't go very well. I do equip Mystic Water to give Surf a little more oomph, and although I do make it further in the fight this time, Sharpedo and crew do chip me down low enough to where Abso can just finish me off. It's time to use several of our 15 rare candies that we picked up throughout the game with Zigzagoon and other means, and this makes Surf a one-shot on the Mightyena to avoid some chip damage, and that's a good sign. Cacturn was already a one-shot, so there's no issue here, and Sharpedo isn't a one-shot, but to avoid its rough skin ability, I do use two Surf. I get confused via Swagger, and I take some chip damage, but it's much better. 
Absolus next. Surf is just off of a one shot and that triggers a citrus berry and that works in my favor because it keeps it out of potion range and that allows me to move on. The last Pokemon is Shift Tree. It's a grass type and Ice Beam quickly can take care of it. I do take some damage but it's not too bad and that's pretty much how Sydney's gonna go. I will have to retry him later but there's no need to go over the fight over and over and over. This is the gist of the fight. It only gets better as I get more levels. Next up is Phoebe and she's the ghost type trainer. Dusclops is up first and Surf cannot one hit it. Shadow Punch is what you want to see because if it uses Curse, I would say this fight is borderline impossible. It seems kind of random in terms of what it chooses, but it really didn't go for it in this run, but my practice runs, it did it a lot. Banana is the next Pokemon and it's similar to Dusclops. It can go for Will of the Wisp and Burn Me, but more often it seems to go for Shadow Ball. It does a lot of damage and honestly, they're pretty similar overall in how much damage they would do, whether you're burned or take a Shadow Ball. Surf and Ice Beam do heavy damage. I do take a Shadow Ball, that triggers a potion. I get a free turn, and then I finish it off. I'm half health. Things are a little dicey at this point. Sableye is next, and this is a very interesting Pokemon. Nothing is super effective since Fairy doesn't exist in Gen 3, and it can tank a shot. It gets off a Shadow Ball, and then I take it out. I'm at 56 health, and there's a second Dust Clops left. Surf can two hit it, and I actually survived the Shadow Ball, but it has a Citrus Berry that restores just enough health to take it out of range, and I faint shortly after, and that's the first attempt. At this point, I decide to just wide out. I'm going to keep the levels, and I'm just going to go through the fight again, and we'll be skipping over Sydney like I said before. The next attempt goes worse despite being a higher level. I get fainted by the Sableye and I wide out again, but I'm going to keep the experience. On the third attempt, I'm able to be extremely healthy going into the final Dust Clops, which is a good thing because I still take heavy damage. I'm able to brute force my way through the fight, and that's how the Phoebe fight usually goes. It's tough, but it's manageable. There are a lot of variables in it. There's a lot of Shadow Balls being tossed around, but it's not too bad. Now let's talk about the Raid Boss and a battle that's in contention for the hardest fight in the run. It's very similar to Wallace, but Glacia is stronger with an overall better team. Thankfully, her first Pokemon isn't a Water type, which means Surf can do neutral damage in the matchup. It takes me a while to kind of realize that. And just like with Wish Cash earlier, you need to get it off first before they use a light screen to destroy your damage. Earthquake and Body Slam still do okay, and overall Glalie's not the problem. Now the fight's going to start getting similar to Wallace. It's a Celio up next, and it's going to be a Body Slam Fiesta to see who can get this paralyzed first. I actually just get crit here, and that's how the first attempt ends. The next attempt starts out, and the fact that I don't outspeed Glalie yet means that I do take some decent chip damage before moving on. It's doable, but it's not setting me up for success. I've taken too much damage to really compete in the Celio matchup, and it just ends up going the same. And from that point, I have to use all of my rare candies. Experience through the first couple of battles just isn't a lot. And this gets me up to level 76. And this makes the Glalie matchup much better. I outspeed and Surf now does extreme damage. It starts off using Hell, which doesn't affect me anyway. It gets a potion and I'm able to get past it with full health. Now it's Celio's time. Body slams are just flying around and I just hope I don't get paralyzed. Neither of us do, but I'm able to do a lot of damage and get past this one without a lot of health gone. But Glacia is a skill lover too and she has a second Celio. I initially meant to make my skill a female for this run, specifically because of this fight because it's going to use a track and it's very annoying. Despite doing well in the fight, a track just makes this one drag on. But something cool that I didn't know initially is that if a Pokemon uses dive, it goes underwater, Surf can still hit it. And not only hit it, it does double damage. I take it out. Things are looking good. Now there's a second Glalie and just like the first one, it's not much of an issue. I don't lose any health and this one's looking doable now. But Glacia really loves Phil. Did I mention that? She has a third Spiel family Pokemon in Walrein waiting at the end. It's another body slam matchup and I'm winning this one easily. I even get the paralysis but full restore comes in, removes it and it slowly starts to outpace me and that's our first defeat at this high of a level. I retry this one lots of times. I can consistently make it to the wall rain, but it's a huge challenge. Things need to go nearly perfect to make this one go right, but eventually I start to just take the wide outs to see if maybe I can get an extra level or two and see if that'll help me out. I get extremely close a time or two, but it just wasn't really meant to be just yet. I start using a citrus berry. It restores 30 HP when you go below half health, and I'm hoping that that's the little push that I'll need to make it through this awful battle. 
finally, after many tries, I do break through. The idea is to get the wall rain to a range to where Earthquake can knock it out. Very similar to Melodic earlier. And in this attempt, I get it right in that range. I avoid the full restore. I end up taking it out exactly as planned. It wasn't clean at all. It's done. And that's good enough for now. But let's look forward. It can't really get any harder, can it? Well, no, it, it's not going to get any harder. I won't even comment on Drake's attire here, but just know that this fight is easier than the first gym badge. Four of his five Pokemon are double weak to ice, and the other one is single weak to it. It's an extremely easy fight. It's not worth going into detail, and it just feels really good to have a reward after finally getting past Glacia for the first time. Now that leaves us with one fight. It's Steven, and just like all champions, he has a balanced team, so let's see how the first attempt goes. He leads with Scar Armory. It's a neutral matchup and I choose to go with Surf. I take some small damage and it gets her full restore but eventually I'm able to surf my way through it. Now comes in a Claydaw. It's weak to water and that's just fantastic. The levels required to get past Glacia means that this is an easy one shot and quickly over with. Next up is Cradley and I love Cradley. It's one of my favorite Pokemon and its typing is very unique. Unfortunately Rock does not resist Ice and its grass typing means that Ice Beam can easily make short work of this. Our Maldo is next and this is the opposite of Cradley. This is a god awful Pokemon and I hate its design with every ounce of my being. Sorry if you're an Armaldo fan. In fact, I hesitate here because I don't even know what type it is. I know it's bug something. It's a one shot with Surf so I'm assuming it's Rock. Next up is Agron and it's looking like Steel is tailor made to absolutely crush Steven. A super effective Surf can one shot it once again and this is almost feeling too easy. Well everyone knows about Steven's ace. It's Metagross and that's Gen 3 pseudo legendary. It hits hard and Meteor Mash will mess me up. I go first and I have Earthquake specifically for this moment. It's super effective but Metagross has bulk which means that it doesn't look like it's going to be a two shot and that's unfortunate. Meteor Mash hits me like a truck, but luckily I packed a Citrus Berry for this very moment and that puts me up to about half health. I think that maybe I could have survived another Meteor Mash, but I get a Miraculous Crit with Earthquake and that's the battle and I'm honestly just glad that I don't have to go back and fight Glacia again. And that's Phil. Overall, it wasn't the best run, but I'm sure it's not the worst either. I originally thought about doing Low Tad, but it's Learn Set really threw me off. I think I could get much better at Ruby and Sapphire and maybe even Emerald, but I'm I'm not sure if I'm going to dive in just yet. I have several requests for Generation 1, so let's just appreciate this Steel Hall of Fame confetti. This one takes just a little over 8 hours, and the bulk of that was the Watson grinding, and a lot of it was just me not being very familiar with the game. The Elite Four section and not resetting also piled up some time. I look up the world record speedrun to get an idea of how, you know, how fast I am, but it looks like I'm not very good at the game. I could optimize this one a lot better. I really enjoyed this one, like a lot. And I hope you did as well. If you made it to the end of the video, I appreciate you. And I hope you have a great day. And I'll be seeing you guys on the next video. Bye.